Uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Hans Gustav Steiner. I'm going to be uh, presenting Pure Data, which is something completely different than Silver Light. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm kind of a pinch hitter, so I'm a little bit disorganized, but in a way that kind of represents the PD community, so um, <laughs> it will work out. Um, I'm going to first start off just doing a really quick hello world and a little simple patch. I think uh, it's easiest just to show PD as it is um, and talk about it. And then talk a little bit about why I spend so much of my time working on PD itself, developing the language, and then uh, go into some example projects of uh, PD. So, to start with, here is PD. Um, we have a big blank canvas here. Um, and it's often known as a canvas or a patch. <coughs> And I'm going to make a hello world. So first I'm going to create an object. Uh, I'm going to make some noise. Hopefully not too loud. Uh, Bring and it. Then, <laughs> then I create an object called DAC, which is a little bit technical. Digital Analog Converter, which is basically the speakers. So here we go. The left, the left inlet is the left speaker, the right inlet, and the right speaker. Pretty straightforward. Uh, this, so this will show you uh, that you have these little boxes and lines, and things are really kind of organized uh, physically a lot of the time. So, and another thing about it that you might have noticed as I'm connecting and deconnecting is that it's running all the time. There's no compiling or um, changing of modes. So here I'm going to turn my noise into an oscillator of 300 hertz. So now we have a nice soothing sine tone. Um, and this introduces the, the next concept in the language where you have basically the, uh, the basic elements of data, sometimes known as atoms, um, are basically lists separated by uh, spaces. So really kind of like words. So the first word is the functionality, like the function or the object, and then the second word is your type of data. So here we have an oscillator at 300 hertz. Um, so now, I think it's fun to do a little bit more uh, with that. So what happens if I take this oscillator? Actually, first do it like this. Uh, Let's say I want to get some mouse data. So there's an object called mouse state. Um, it gives you information about the mouse. I send it a I send it a message it's telling mouse state hold the mouse and give me the data. So now I have the x y coordinates of the mouse. And now once once you have uh, data like this. Once it's in PD, it's all just numbers. No matter where it came from, it's it's just numbers, and what uh, you do with it is up to you. So I can just freely hook it up to my oscillator <laughs> and have control like that. Uh, well, maybe I should uh, add a uh, volume control real quick. <laughs> That's pretty annoying. Uh, so. This is a multiply, um, and we're basically multiplying the audio, and if you multiply, so audio is a stream of numbers. If you multiply something by zero, uh, you get a whole bunch of zeros, and that means no sound. Um, multiply something by one, you get unchanged. So you get unchanged sound. By 0.5, then you have half volume, and that's amplification. So I can, so my mouse, okay. I'm going to divide this quickly by 767, because that's how big my screen is. That gives me... 0 to 1, which is a handy volume control. So I have a little instrument. Um, and just for fun, now, I'm going to try multiplying my oscillator by something else, by my microphone. So now I have a ring modulator, so I can modulate my voice in real time. 
This is, hopefully, didn't look too complicated. Um, <laughs> to start with. Uh, I start with audio because that's really the foundations of PD. Um, but it can do a lot of other things, which I hope to illustrate. So on that note, um, I'm going to talk about my philosophy behind it. First, that's pure data. It's also known as PD. That's me. Um, uh, that's the community, the main community website. Um, and so, uh, I'm really glad to be part of this conference because it really, like, the, the, the themes that like, Golan has set out is really central to why I work with Pure Data. So, I also want to add my take on it, um, starting with that interactivity is, is something that's essential to humans. Um, everyone interacts all the time, and, and people get depressed when they're not interacting. It's just it's part of being human. Um, tools are also something that's essential to humans. Every, Human culture creates tools. Every person uses tools, builds tools. I mean, whether it's very simple things uh, to complicated large computers, whatever, we all use tools. Um, more and more, these tools that we use all the time are electronic or computers. Um, and I mean, here are just some examples. I mean, we vote with computers more and more. We, we talk to people with, with computers and electronics. We listen to music. We on and on and on. I mean, we maps our our computers. Um, so, and, and, and we're even communicating um, through these electronic tools all the time. Um, I, I mean, it seems like a lot of people probably communicate more through electronic tools than in, in person with their voice these days. Uh, and one thing that troubles me about this is that these tools, like Golan mentioned, are generally created with the idea that Someone else makes them, and we use them. And that's really different than the way we think about literacy, and the way we think about speaking. Or somebody speaking, no one had ever assumed that you're only taught to understand. And writing, this is long an assumption that every, when we teach someone to read, we teach them to write. Um, so this, what, right now in computers, for the most part, we have this idea that we're only teaching people to read, and not so much to write. So, to be in a democracy, it's essential to read and write. Um, and, and it's not a democracy when only a few can write, can express themselves. So, one thing, a big movement in this direction is, is free software, where um, you are free to get the whole source code of, the, uh, of all the, the tools, and you're free to modify them however you want. Um, and this is an example here of OpenOffice. Uh, and some source code here. Um, but part of the problem here now is, well, most people who use OpenOffice probably aren't really going to want to dig too deep into the other side. And, and also, these programs are, are so large that even if you are an expert in C++, you're probably not going to want, I mean, it, it would take a, it's a pretty steep learning curve just to get into modifying something like OpenOffice. It's this huge thing. Um, so really, open source is just the beginning of this. Uh, it's the first step. What we really need now is to change how we think about programming. Um, we need to think about programming as something that everyone does. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to learn Java or C++ or things like that. Um, the, the, these are programming languages um, that were designed by engineers for engineers, and, and they are very good at making engineers efficient and can write huge programs. But there's a, a huge learning curve to that. Um, so I think we can explore uh, other ways of programming that are really designed with the, first and foremost, the idea of general literacy. I mean, you can think of something like a stenographer. I mean, we have systems of writing that are much more efficient, but they're also harder to use. So Court reporters can write really fast. But most of us don't need to write so fast. And in what more important, we have a system that everyone here knows and, and we can teach to, to five year olds. So this is how we need to think about programming. And this is what will then lead to rewrite tools. Uh, when everyone is liter literate and then we're interacting through the computer all the time, um, then it'll, it, 
it is no longer something that is just handed down to us, but something that we're constantly engaging with. So, visual programming. Um, this is the basics of PD. Um, what we have are, uh, in the middle, objects, as they're known as, uh, which are the building blocks of uh, the programming, the little elements of logic or functionality. Um, and you can tell them, uh, if you, you can see that the box is square on all, on all sides. Uh, and the objects communicate with messages. Uh, and there's objects generate messages and receive messages, but it, then there's also these message boxes where you can type them in. And you can see they have that little kind of indent on the end. Um, then there's different ways of displaying it. So you see that the box at the bottom where it says this is a long message, um, it has a little cutoff corner and that just means it's a display box. Uh, so, yeah, and you can see a simple version of what I built there on the right, another oscillator outputting to sound. Um, and then another basic thing, on the upper right we have a little slider, uh, which is a, a very easy way to get uh, interaction from, from the user or the programmer. Um, so, this, this whole paradigm of uh, visual programming uh, works on a simple scale like I showed you, and then it, it also, uh, people use it to write quite complicated programs. This one isn't so complicated, it's pretty big building blocks. Uh, this is basically uh, a, an audio effect based on FFT analysis. Uh, so, some of these building blocks are pretty big, um, and but some of them, right, like somewhere in the middle, you can see QAR, SQRT tilde, uh, which is not the most comprehensible one, but it's a math. It's that right there is an object that's written in view that you can open up. Um, so, where did PD come from? Um, th this is really where it started. And this is pr probably wh why it has this kind of physical feel to it. Um, P PD started uh, as, uh, basically it's part of Max, the Max family, um, like Maximus P, which we presented later. Uh, and these started uh, as a programming, a way to control synthesizers like this here, um, where at the time, um, in, the, in the 70s and into the 80s, the way people were creating synthesizers with these modular electronics is by patching a bunch of wires together. Uh, and each one of these little slots would be a little separate module of functionality, and you would build a synthesizer by plugging them all in with these patch wires. Um, so I had this very physical aspect to it, and uh, you could you know, trace the, how, the, how the synthesizer was running by running your hands on the wires, but it roughly ended up looking like a, a rat's nest. Um, so this, this is one thing that is an advantage and a disadvantage of PD. Um, you have this very direct relationship. You know, I want an oscillator, and it makes a tone, and there's a box there. If I want five oscillators, I make five boxes, um, and then the, there's five tones I can play with. Um, but that means you have to have actually five physical things that you're managing. Um, so people have written objects like this poly poly, um, which is used for building synthesizers. So it can, you can manage many instances of the same object. But it's funny because it, it's actually a patch that if you open it up and look inside, it's made many copies of the patch. And so there's still this one-to-one -one relationship that's physical. Um, so now I've been talking a lot about objects um, and and messages, but this is not. It's an important distinction here that this PD is not object-oriented programming as we know of it in terms of something like Java or C++ or small, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that it is somewhat similar that you have objects that speak to each other in messages, but there's no inheritance and there's no hierarchy. Um, so you don't have a hierarchy of classes, that each one is just its own little entity. Um, and they can't inherit from each other. Um, 
And so what you ba basically the way things are structured in PD are that the objects tend to be much simpler than an object in uh, something like Java, where uh, like the oscillator that I showed, uh, so it has two inlets. You give it a stream of numbers. Uh, on the left-hand side, that controls the frequency. You give it a string of numbers on the right-hand side, that controls the phase of the os oscillator. So you have two controls, um, and that's the whole element. So it, it's something maybe like, if people are familiar with the Unix command line, it's kind of a good example, where it's just lots of little simple utilities that you put together uh, to build more <coughs> complex uh, programs. Um, and so perhaps that, I don't think you could write the kind of programs that these giant programs that are written to maybe run a battleship to a PD, <laughs> because you would rapidly hit the ceiling of complexity. But what it means is that, that you can just walk up and start patching and using libraries very quickly. Um, and I've built some pretty big programs with it, uh, and I don't feel like I've hit the limit yet. These are programs of you know, one or two or three people, not hundreds or thousands. So the other key part of this uh, is often called it a graphical data flow language. Um, and this, I find, that, uh, when teaching it, people who have a strong programming background in language and procedural or object-oriented product programming often have more difficulties with it than people who have not programmed at all. Uh, because it works quite a bit differently. Um, I mean, you don't have really loops and things like that. You don't really store data. Um, it's all about how things flow. Um, so you basically, you set up a series of operations uh, and just chain them until they end up at the result. And let's say if you're at the bottom and you want to do it again, then you have a test at the bottom that says send a connection to the top and do it again. So this is a very simple example of um, either of just assembling little bits of messages into uh, in the, the top right sends out something in order, so the trigger enforces execution order. Another thing that's a little odd is that the execution order is from right to left, not left to right, but I don't even get used to it. Uh, and so you can see that first the message set goes out, set um, will clear the box at the bottom, and then uh, the rest of them go through and are built into the message, but starting right to left, so you can see it says now this makes sense. So another thing that the way that, that the types are made uh, are somewhat unique. Um, basically, the, the two when you're dealing with there's the signal data, which I sh we showed, which is usually audio. Uh, but then when you're dealing with kind of the programming logic, you have either floats, which are basically a, a number, anything that can be interpreted as a number, and that's what the type, type the typing system does, and you can see a bunch of examples of numbers, uh, including scientific notation and things like that. And then uh, the other one, a symbol or symbolic atom, is really defined in terms of what it's not. It's anything that's not a number. <laughs> so if you make it, so you see like three dot dot two. Well, it's close to three point two, but it's not. So it's a symbol. Um, this is. It makes things really kind of straightforward to deal with. You're not really thinking about typing, but sometimes when you want it, it can really. Let's say you want a, a symbol that is a number. Then things get hard. Um, yeah. So, one of the things that, I, my, my background is mostly sound, uh, and one of the things I've done with it is like my demo with making it instruments. Here's a more complicated instrument, uh, that, I mean, that is the whole program. Um, and one of the things that I've tried to work on with it is, is to try and make instrument building um, similar to to learning a, a, a traditional instrument where you can learn an instrument just by picking it up and playing with it and seeing what it does. Um, so I, I think because there, you can just kind of freely connect things, there's very little 
typing to worry about the connections. Uh, I mean, there's two types of connections. The thick ones are the audio, and then the, every, the, all the logic goes to the thin ones. Uh, you can really just kind of try stuff out really quickly and see what happens. And if, it, if you like it, then that's, that's all it takes. Um, if it does what you want it to. Uh, then, um, so really this metaphor of, of play kind of guides me in the way I try and design uh, objects and things like that, where I want to focus on the ideas of uh, things like um, that you have a very short feedback loop that you can freely connect things. Um, and, and that the syntax is, is very uh, simple and not in the way I, I, I mean, you see there's no, uh, for the most part, there's no, I mean, there's no semicolons, really, a little bit. Uh, you can completely avoid semicolons if you want to. Um, uh, and then you separate things by spaces, so it's kind of like words. There's not really any punctuation for the most part. Um, and, and actually, uh, if you wanted to stylistically, you could probably could avoid, all, avoid all of the special characters. Uh, so, I would say the fundamentals of what PD is all about is about um, real-time interaction. Um, like what I generated here. It's about getting data from one source and um, processing it and outputting it to something like sound or video or products or anything that you want to happen in real, real time. So that's, that's where it shines. Um, but people have uh, people have used it for a lot of other things. Um, and one of the keys, I think, to, that makes it kind of immediate is that from the, in, its inception um, as, at, at IRCOM, it was developed with art projects. It was never, there was never a time where someone's like, hmm, I'm going to make this program and an artist will use it. Um, <laughs> It, it would, it, they had, uh, had a synthesizer, another pocket was working with a composer, they were, they were writing a piece, and they said, another pocket, this is a pain, uh, maybe I can make this so we can kind of patch it together and then work on the programming together. And, and that's still the case very much with PD. Uh, all of the developers are also practicing artists, and I think it's also the same thing for national people um, who are working at Cycling 74 also use it in there. Uh, so now you might wonder why I'm also mentioning Max in this. It's because they're, they're very closely related. Um, this is the, the Max family tree from IRCOM. Um, and you can see it's kind of split a bunch of times. Even within IRCOM, there's three different versions, or maybe, maybe even more. Um, and then it's split off to Max, uh, David Ziccarelli up there in the upper left, split off to Max and Maximus P. Uh, Miller Pocket went off and did PD, some of the code from PD went into maximum speed. So it's this kind of mix and match, and each one with slight differences. Um, so I really think, I mean, this is when you have artists working with the tools and it's something that they feel a sense of ownership with, then they modify it in ways that they find useful. Um, and I think this is reflected in the fact that, well, these are all recognizably max, but they've um, they all have their idiosyncrasies and they kind of follow the paths of the different developers. Um, so PD has very much followed this lineage. So PD started it in, in 95 or 96. Um, and it has not, it's far from monolithic. Um, so Miller Pocket still maintains what's known as PD vanilla, the kind of core of it, which is very focused on sound. Um, but people have built many, many different libraries and they're mostly included in PD Extended. Um, then there was a branch, Desire Data, which really aimed to try and make a, um, they really focused on how do you make a editor uh, to, for a visual programming language that takes away some of the annoyances, like um, sometimes dealing with physical connections can be a real pain, um, so you can automate things like that. Um, then on the other side, um, the PD Devel and Rebrez, they were really interested in getting the absolute lowest latency possible, and that was their one main goal, you know, one goal, but it was a central goal. And so while other people didn't want to sacrifice some things for low latency, so they made their own version, which is very much usable. Um, and then now uh, we have this PDevel 4E1, which is 
uh, trying to uh, again approach um, how you make an editor for visual programming language and try and make the process as fluid as possible. Um, so, one of my favorite one of my favorite things about PBE, where did it go? Um, is that well, all the tools, it's, all, it's very open, and then you have people who, <coughs> you can do all the sound synthesis in a patch. And so now instead of distributing MP3s, people distribute a patch that this is playing the song live. This isn't recorded. There's actually only one sample in this whole thing. Um, and you can watch it. He even included a little GUI, so you can watch it kind of automatically going. But I can also just start messing with it. So this is that bass. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Shut it down. That's the one sample. Shut down. It's not. So I can just start. It's not. It's not shutting down. Remixing on the fly. Now this may not be the most developed GUI. Oh, it looks like there's ring light here on my. But um, it's something that it, you put together quite quickly. Uh, <laughs> there's some fix the bug. Um, I never thought I'd see uh, a resonance cascade, let alone create one.
something uh, uh, a little bit more maybe traditional uh, music interface is something called NetPD, which is uh, maybe something like live or something like it's a, you know lots of buttons and sliders for controlling sequences of music uh, live. Uh, but the big twist is that it's all coordinated but, uh, over the network on a central server. So when you log into the same server, everyone has is controlling the same interface. So when someone goes and starts adding notes to your sequence, everyone who's logged in uh, also has the notes added. And so you basically have these kind of it's like you know ten people playing the same live patch. Um, and so this one is trying. This one, I was starting to think, well, I like this patching thing, but it's pretty limited, and you can't really do that. I guess because I had a background in programming, and I was thinking, why? Well, who would ever do like? Text parsing in PD is such a headache. You know, I'm just using something like Perl. Really, but no. Uh, so I, I meet when I met this guy, uh, Ramon Hefley, who uh, he he built this whole server using PD because he that's what he knew, um, and he did it. it, it distrib so you upload your you make a patch on your computer and you upload it. It's then distributed to everyone who's logged in. So. It sends it via the server to multiple computers, but it, it's not even that simple. It'll go and check um, is it all are all the versions of the patches up to date and things like that. So he did a whole network distribution system with um, version checking and all on PD. And I was like, oh, 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 like what? <laughs> <laughs> and so that kind of really kicked me. I was like, well, I mean, yeah, I guess he can really do some programming. So maybe I should try and think more along that line. Um, and I def this is also in, in the spirit of PD. You can download the whole thing. There's tons of patches. You can reuse them for pick anything you want if you don't want to always play with other people. Uh, and so and now, this, this is a group called CHDH. Um, as Cyril Henry right there and uh, Nicolas Montgermain, um, who are both, they play together. Um, and they have kind of, for me, it seems like a very PD-ish mix of things because they built instruments that are uh, controlled by these um, uh, these motorized fader boxes, so they each are playing the same instruments. And so their motorized faders mean when one moves the slider, then the other one's in sync. Um, but these instruments are based on physical models, and then they generate. So you're kind of like moving a spring or ma a mass around with the slider, and then they generate audio based on that, but also video at the same time or graphics. Um, so it's really just everything's a number in there, so it's just uh, all uh, mixed up. So this is some snippets of an earlier performance of them. Oh. Well. <laughs> oh, it's very quiet. So you get these very very tight sync between the uh, the motion and um, the sound. So I, I, for me, it really feels like the sound and the image are this, the same entity. And so you can actually uh, you can download their most recent album, which. Uh, it's, on a, well, it's on a DVD, so it's huge, or you can buy the DVD. Um, and with it comes all of the patches that they use to make it. Uh, and so this is a big part of it. People just share all of the materials. When they, Now it's becoming more and more common. People make an album, and on the album, they include all the, all the patches they use to make it. My search turns out from the... Uh, from the uh, yeah. So many control, right? All right. So this is um, a very simple example of what you can do with physical modeling in PDE. <laughs> and the accelerometer in, in many laptops. And then something, uh, 
fair amount different. Um, this is a work with a group called the Morphic Robot Works. It's based on a, a robot, this guy called Yo-Yo Barabao, who was originally created to play along with this, uh, an orchestra. But he was sequenced then. It was just a MIDI sequencer pre-prepared, and they hit play, and the orchestra followed. Um, at the time, I just kind of was interested in the, the trying to track the flow of a conversation and mimic it with a computer. And I, and I thought, huh, well, this guy plays rhythms and has a lot of characters, so maybe I can use this kind of back and forth tracking to make him interact with people with rhythm. So it basically listens for rhythms, mostly clapping, and kind of riffs on it. It's basically a, I mean, in effect it's a buggy, uh, it, it's buggy, but it tries to reproduce what you've made. Um, and originally I was like, I should fix these bugs, but then I started listening to the people going there like, and when, when things went wrong, they didn't think it was buggy, they said it, it didn't like that. <laughs> you know, it's trying to do better. So, uh, yeah, it's got um, so here, there's the computer. It's, it's kind of the Wizard of Oz effect. There's behind, you know, long cables and behind a black curtain, there's a computer running. Around. <laughs> and it's just there's just a mic placed in the head, that, and it follows um, the, the rhythm that it hears based on impulse detection. You can see it's listening until they stop. And then now they stop, so it starts playing. <laughs> and it runs on just about any computer you can find, uh, including an iPod. So this. <laughs> This is what I've been working on a lot recently. I just uh, about a year ago, I just had a realization that you know, all these embedded computers—they're like PCs. They're all the same thing on the inside, uh, except they're—they're they're not an x86, they're an ARM processor. But really, like every phone, every iPod, Wi-Fi router—they're all like a PC. So we should be running. We should be—we shouldn't be throwing these things away. We should be putting new software on them, doing fun stuff like this. All right. So this is this thing is 80 megahertz. Not not a very powerful computer, but enough to run a little. Pocket uh, sequencer.
It's it's really good real-time interaction. Someday, maybe um, someone will write OpenOffice in Phoebe. <laughs> uh, on that note, um, I'm giving a demo workshop-ish thing tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, if you want, you can come and just watch me, but it's a lot more fun if you have PD on your, on your computer. Um, and it's free, and it works on just about anything, so you can download it, purdata.org slash downloads, if you want to come with it. Um, and it's usually pretty easy to install. Um, so if not, if, if you have trouble, just we can uh, quickly troubleshoot things at the beginning. Um, and so that was PD. I'm Hans. Thank you very much. <laughs>